Today's horror story is written by and features Stygian sagas. When Orm first told me about the silo, I imagined something very different. Our group tended to operate in out-of-the-way secluded hovels and hideaways, easily missed by the world at large, and that caution had served us well. The things we did were more than a little strange, and often more than a little illegal. Hedonistic pursuit of fresh and novel experiences had drawn each of us into the pact. But we were far from wild addicts. Our pleasures were sought with the utmost discretion, carried out in the shadows where we might continue uninterrupted. The silo might have been dark and foreboding, but it was far from discreet. It was an old military installation on a privately owned tract of ranch land in eastern Colorado. Though once it had housed an intercontinental missile, the place had been left to rot more than three decades ago and had fast fallen into disrepair. The trespasses of local teenagers and drunken adventurers into the ruins had resulted in a couple of accidental deaths, and the owner of the large plot had taken to keeping the place locked up tight. Alarm systems meant to wake him from sleep studded the pasturage around the silo, and the entrance to the ruin was sealed against the wanderings of the unwary. All this Orem told me up front and every bit of it made my skin squirm with tantalizing fear. The chances of getting caught were high, something which made the thought of even trying to gain entry exciting. Still, as I've said, we members of the pact were no fools, and there was no surer way to end a storied career of uniquely debauched pleasures than to end up behind bars or hounded by suspicious authorities. Better to play it safe, I argued. When he told me why we needed to go there, my protests fast faded away. There were, Orm told me, a great many more members of the pact than our small band from St. Louis led me to believe. Our ragtag band of a dozen or so sadists, gluttons, and delinquents was but a small fraction of the pact which had autonomous chapters around the continent. Orm led our group, and had done so throughout the decade I had spent chasing thrills with the pact. I had shown promise, he said, and with time, the organization wished for me to branch out and start my own coven. Bleeding sensations onto new streets and into new towns. The silo was a rite of passage, he told me sitting alone with him in my dingy apartment before dawn. I was so enthralled with the prospect of power that I didn't question. Even when he threw in that awful sentence near the end of the pitch, which retrospectively sounds so icy and ominous, I couldn't do anything save bob my head and agree. Strange things happen down there, he said, dark eyes boring into mine. I'll lead you in. If you've made it out, come the dawn, and you're still interested in the position, we'll consecrate you as a full member, then and there. We drove out together, the long drive trickling past at a glacial pace, as I counted each mile and dwelt upon what was to come. When we climbed out on the side of a dusty gravel road through a stint of barren pasturage, the sunset had already gone, and the night had drowned the grassland in an ethereal lunar glow. We ducked a barbed wire fence and tracked a little over two miles in the dark, navigating the rolling hills by the nascent light of the moon. Orem advised us against the use of lights, and he carefully shifted our route to avoid cameras and motion-activated beacons, he said, dotted the property. A tense half-hour brought us to a rusted, bunker-like metal door 
upon whose face moldered ancient graffiti. It was set into a gentle embankment, and far beyond I could just see the outline of the sealed top of the missile silo. It was then that I knew the facility must be large, but I still didn't grasp the scale of it from above ground. I wondered whether we faced cameras at the entrance, but Orem approached without a moment's hesitation and pounded a fist against the doorway. Two men swung wide the creaking doors. It felt, for all the world, like I was looking into the mouth of a tomb, but the quickening beats of my heart only drove me onward. Orem bowed to the strangers, who returned the gesture, before he led me into the long, dark. Only then did the lights come out, their blinding beams revealing low ceilings, peeling paint and metalwork so caked with rust that much of it was unrecognizable. The smell of mildew and age hung heavy in the stagnant air, and I could almost feel the hanging dust which flickered before our flashlights. The two strangers hung back at the entrance, and I followed Orem as he wound down the main access corridor into the winding labyrinth of halls beyond. Barracks, cafeterias, and bustling electronics arrays probably cluttered the place once. They had all fallen to entropy, and the outlines of chairs and archaic computer equipment was often shrouded by mold or covered by aging spray paint. The beer cans and refuse that littered the ground were old, most from the 90s. And though the silo had once housed the raucous ramblings of the local youth, our shoes seemed to kick up the caked cobwebs of dust and many years. I asked Orem how frequently the pact consecrated new members here, but he seemed so mesmerized by our surroundings that the words slipped past him like vapor. His eyes raked the walls, and he seemed to savor every tepid breath of the rotting air, as if trying his hardest to remember a dream long forgotten. I didn't press him further, for Orem can be brutal when he's angry. I was content to trudge on in silence, listening to the scurry of mice scattered by our approach, trying to plot out a route for my return trip. This was easier said than done. Occasionally, a particularly vibrant piece of graffiti or a heinous pile of moldering material would draw my eye, but the decay and the dense sprawl of the tunnels and living quarters through which we passed made every twist and turn seem to mirror the last. I expected there were signs and markings on the stained walls once, but they had long since been eaten away by time. By the time we reached the silo proper, I was more than a bit certain. I was lost. The missile the facility had once housed was long gone. The hallways through which we'd come emptied out into a creaking metal scaffolding, ringing a vast, empty pit. Beyond the railing, the silo plunged fifty or so feet downward before vanishing into the depths of a murky, rust-stained pool of still water. Twisted ladders and fallen wiring stuck up from the liquid like grasping limbs but our lights couldn't dwell past the surface. It was oily and opaque, and the air was fouler here than anywhere else in the ruin. The silo kept going, at least fifty more feet to the bottom, but what lay beneath we couldn't say. Groundwater had breached the facility, or so Orm said. This was the site of my passage, as he pried my light away from me and left it perched next to one of the few sturdy ladders downward, he reiterated what I was to do. I listened, nodded, and did my best to control my scattered thoughts. When Orm at last wished me good fortune and withdrew, he left me standing on the brink above the distant water, all traces of his departing flashlight soon devoured by the hungry shadows of the silo. Every rational part of me wished to kneel down and retrieve my light, but fighting the urge and following my orders fed the growing icy terror which was building in the pit of my stomach. 
and I savored the sensation. I stripped down to an undershirt and ragged old shorts, doing my best to fold the clothes I'd shed and leave them next to my waiting flashlight. I took even more care not to knock the thing over in the dark. If I lost track of my place in here, I would never make the exit by daybreak. I paused for several petrified minutes before the jump. Underground, the dark is so absolute that your vision seems to squirm with dim patterns in the blackness, as if you've scrunched shut your eyes, even when they're wide open and desperate for something to latch onto. Though I could not see the drop yawning open beneath me, I could almost feel the cool, empty, damp air over the gap. Each breath I took reverberated off the concrete of the far walls and bounced down the silo to the water. Every once in a while, some tiny mode of rust or debris from the massive silo doors overhead would plunge into the pool and make me jump at the sudden sound. The old metal beneath my feet creaked as I shifted from foot to foot, teeth grit, trying to force myself to move. When I did finally jump, I feared I'd land too near the edge and get impaled or mangled on some jutting debris in the water. This didn't come to pass, and as I plunged into the freezing liquid, I blindly oriented myself downwards and began to swim. My thoughts were equally tumultuous on the descent, but by that point, necessity made me keep always on the move. The cold and awful sightless murk of the water was only made more jarring by the almost sticky consistency of some pockets of the foul pool. It was as if great rifts of some tar-like spill had diluted it, and each new push downward felt more and more sickly and subdued as I went. This was likely as much to do with the depth as it was any pollutants or chemicals in the water. But still, the sensation made me feel as if I were digging to the base of a chute of quicksand rather than swimming towards the silo's bottom. Keep going, Oraman told me. You'll know when you've made it. I repeated these words over and over again as I desperately kicked and paddled, assuring myself the end couldn't be far off even as my lungs began to burn and the panic began to take a toll on my thoughts. Something ragged raked my bare calf, an unyielding hunk of corroded metal by the feel of it, and the strange sensation made me move all the faster. My arms were outstretched at the end of each lunge, desperate to touch bottom, my head hurting more and more the deeper I went. Just reach the end, I told myself. You'll know when you've made it. What happened next is still a mystery to me. As second after harrowing second trickled past in the blind darkness, without a floor rising up to meet me, I became convinced my time would run out before I escaped the pool. A minute or more as frenzied swimming lessened the pressure building in my skull beneath the weight of the water. Then, as swiftly as I had begun, the plunge ended. I burst to the surface of the pool, confused, sightless and groping as I tried to regain my bearings. The floor had never met me. I must have gotten turned around in the sightless gloom, I told myself. Who knows what twists and contortions I'd undergone while my heart thudded against my ribs in the cold dark down below. I bobbed motionless for a moment, my fear of the blank canvas around me momentarily dulled. Had I just failed? How in the world did I get turned around? It certainly didn't feel like I'd gotten turned around. To this day, even with all these pain days between me and the silo, I still can't bring myself to accept that I just got mixed up on the plunge. At the time, though, I was more worried about what came next. Would they know I hadn't made it? Should I try the dive again? I was just beginning to litigate this contest in my head when something brushed against the bare sole of my foot. I froze, 
looking down as if I might see something through the blinding black. It came again, something soft, warm against the chill of the water. It was moving. Even my craving for heightened sensations couldn't blunt the panic which overcame me then. I swam desperately along the surface, dreading another touch from below, praying I'd find the ladder. When I pushed through the tangle of rubber-lined wires and hit concrete, I spasmed like I'd been injured until I realized that things were inanimate. Even as I began to breathe a sigh of relief and shrug off my frenzied retreat, something breached the water behind me in the center of the pool. Water parted and trickled off that unseen something as it rose from the surface. There was a snort, low and rumbling, and a hot mist fell over the pool. Scrambling along the concrete wall, groping for a ladder in the darkness, I vividly recall likening the noise to the blow of a breaching whale. It sounded large. Desperate seconds brought my hands to the rusted metal rungs, and I began to climb, my limbs shaking as I left the water and hit the cool air. Just below me, another snort sounded, much closer this time. I had sped up perhaps 15 or 20 rungs, scraping my hands and banging my knees all the while, when something closed around my ankle. It had a consistency like wet sandpaper. Muscles rippled beneath the flesh, for that is the only thing I can think to call it, like those of a snake. It began to tighten, slow but methodical. The sensation lasted only a second before I kicked it free. Perhaps it was startled. Perhaps I merely slipped out of its grip before it had a chance to get a good hold of me. I've dwelt on how I made it up that ladder many times. But in the end, I'll hopefully never have to know. I clambered onto the scaffolding after a few breathless moments in the air, scrambled over the metal in search of my clothes and found the grip of my flashlight. I wheeled around and foolishly flicked it on. Almost blinded by the sudden searing brightness, I came close to tumbling back over the edge into the pool. My eyes were so ragged after the flash that I only saw a massive silhouette down below, its dark bulk receding into the depths of the silo beneath the rippling pool. I had scant few seconds to let my thoughts catch up with me the light's dazzling beam dancing off the rusted ceiling as the sloshing waters below tossed its reflection around the cavernous room. I blinked the pain of the light away, trying to shake off the chill of the filthy water, and slid on my clothes with shivering clumsiness, all the while glaring down on the water, coming to terms with what had just happened. I had yet to really recover from the experience when a heavy clang echoed from far off in the facility. Metal striking metal, like a hammer against a stubborn nail. The sound drove Orm's whispered words back to the fore of my garbled thoughts, bringing frightful clarity to the hazy decay which pressed in from all sides. You'll be tempted to use your light, if you can find it. He said as we lingered on the precipice, just before I'd been plunged into darkness. I'd advise against that. There are other things which use light where you're going. I killed the light with jittery fingers. I threw out a hand, grabbed the rail which ringed the silo, and took a moment to steady myself, ears keen for sound as my blind eyes raked impenetrable shadow. When nothing came, I took tentative steps along the rail, my grip my only guide along the walkway and my other hand stretched out wide to brush the brittle cracked paint along the concrete wall. The wall fell away. I turned in that direction and shuffled forward till my shins struck the rusted stairway. Keeping close to the wall, I climbed, beginning the long process of retracing my steps towards the surface. Each motion undertaken with the strictest care, I did all I could to muffle any sounds my intrepid footfalls sent echoing down the halls. The main passages and walkways of the facility were relatively clear, but they were frequently broken by intersecting hallways or descending staircases to other parts of the complex, making me pause in the open to try to stumble upon where the passage resumed in the darkness. Minutes dragged on, 
and though I was often tempted to banish the shadows with the light I kept gripped tight in my free hand, I always fought off the urge, my ears straining for any sound beyond my strained, hushed breaths. As more time passed, and the strange noise I'd heard in the vacant halls was put farther from me, I began to gain confidence. I seemed to pass effortlessly from walkway to walkway, and like a mouse warming to its new maze, I familiarized myself with the odd bends and corroded textures of the metal rails I used to guide my progress in the dark. As I grew comfortable with the rhythms of walking blind, I blessed the name of every strange deity I could dredge up from my memory that I wasn't blind in the water. This, at least, was manageable. Through it all, the nagging memory of that noise kept me from using the light. No amount of comfort could totally scrub away the echoes of that haunting clang. My rhythm was shaken when I came to an intersection with a broad section of walkway, one which yawned wide enough that my hands only found empty air if I leaned out from one rail in search of the opposite side. This, I knew, had to be the big hall that led right up to the entrance. I recalled there had been just one turn we'd made along our route down to the silo, off from this walkway into the more cramped quarters through which I'd climbed. I hesitated, trying to think, cursing that I'd not been more attentive during the nervous walk in from the surface. Which way to the exit? Deciding we had taken a left turn on the way in, I swung right around the corner and proceeded what felt like 30 or 40 yards down the way. I almost tumbled in the dark when I came across the precipice of a downed stairway, arms wheeling for balance. My light clattered off the walkway and into the mess of metal piping and wiring which clogged the walls to either side, and for a moment, my eyes were jolted as the beam danced on during its deafening journey to the floor. Realized I'd made a mistake, the moment of dazzling illumination tossed out by the light showed I was headed into a cluttered storage room area lined with aging, slumped shelves and piled refuse. I must be turned around, I told myself. We had taken a right on the way down, I decided. I had just enough time to curse aloud in the dark before the light cracked against the concrete and plunged me into darkness yet again. I turned around, right arm catching the railing as my guide, head turning blindly forward as I shuffled the first few stride into the long stint toward the entrance. Keep moving, you'll be out in a moment. That was the only mantra that kept me from panic after the fumble on the stairs. I'd almost reached the intersection again, when I realized I was not quite blind. I froze. The vaguest outlines of the rails and pipes around me loomed out of the dark as half-glimpsed silhouettes. The bony white of painted lettering on the walls glimmered so faintly it might have been invisible had I not just spent ages staring into total blackness. As I stood still, heart racing, the light grew bolder. Catching the deep reds of valves and the dull orange of rust, weak as it was my stomach dropped as it drew nearer and I realized where it was coming from. I stood with my back to the storage room. Ahead of me, Across the newly visible intersection was the exit, still obscured by the deep shadow of the farther halls. To my left was the downward path to that rotten, waterlogged silo. To my right was another hall, low-ceilinged and dingy with a dusty mist. Through that mist, bobbing and flickering with motion, a sickly, bluish light was coming nearer. Though I could not yet see what produced the light, I'd begun to hear it. A soft, subdued clamor, similar to the sounds my own bare palms made tracing the rails. A ragged, almost animalistic rasping, muffled by the chilly thickness of the damp air. Worst of all was the fleshy, scraping sound which rattled my thoughts in the gloomy hall, like a massive python or lizard dragging its soft stomach across the unforgiving floor. Then the scent reached me, overwhelming the metallic tang of rust. A sickly ammonia stink made my eyes water in the gloom. It was the rotten miasma of 
damp wood which has been left to molder on the dark forest floor, but infinitely stronger than any shattered stump or discarded lumber. I began to lurch backward on tender feet into the storage room. Each motion down the half-visible staircase was clumsy and probing, but I exercised every effort in keeping the noise at a minimum. Once more, my hands guided me along the rail. Agonizing seconds brought me back up against one of the shelves of the storeroom, and I wove into the shadows of the rows, trying not to trip over the shattered machinery and fallen containers on the floor. All the while, the light grew brighter, the noise louder, the smell fouler. I came to rest at the back corner of the large room, cursing the noises I brushed aside refuse to crouch low near the ground. The light, which had slunk out into the hall, was by then descending the stairs into the storage room. The wet slithering of its progress was magnified by the concrete walls. There were six rows of sagging shelves in the room, three to either side of the main entryway, and my hiding spot at the far end of one of the rows was anything but adequate. Though I could not see through the stacks, the ambient gleam of my pursuer showed me it was already making its way down the central aisle. Probing with senses I dared not guess at for whatever made the noise. The gleam showed my straining eyes that there was no other exit from the little storeroom. No back door or further hall into which I could slip as the slithering thing grew closer and that cesspit stench brought me to silent tears. I began to imagine my discovery and to debate whether I could slip back down one of the aisles and out of the exit before the thing wandering the rows found me. How well could it see in the dark? How fast could it really move? Would it act differently in pursuit than it had in investigation? If it caught me, and I have no doubts even now that was its goal, what then? It was only by chance in those frenzied seconds that I looked up and found that the corner opposite my own wasn't empty. It's a marvel I didn't gasp or recoil, but I suppose the weight of the situation kept me stifled and still. Crouched, just as I was, white eyes white in the tepid shadows cast by the searching light, was a lean woman, perhaps slightly older than I, she was as filthy as I must have been, and in the seconds we spent looking at one another, I rifled through an hour's feverish wondering in the space of harried movements. There was more than one of us in here. Perhaps Orm's compatriots had led their own initiates down into the dark. Where had they taken her, and why had she ended up back here? She must have been closer to the entrance than I. Perhaps she'd been spooked back to the storage room, just as I'd been. Perhaps my own initial approach had been the thing that sent her scuttling into the dark to hide. Now, after my stumble had brought the light down on us, she glared with all the horrified finality of a condemned criminal. We were, I suppose she thought, both doomed, all thanks to me. What prefaced my next move, I cannot say. I didn't think it over, it came as naturally as breathing, seeming to creep up and happen without my conscious input. I didn't even register that it was happening until I'd made my move, until I'd made it up the rusting stairs into the main hallway and was back on my way to the surface. And even then, the gravity of the thing didn't hit till much, much later. The light drew in close. There was breathing, now, if that's what you'd call it, a sort of wavering rasp, like a light wind through pine trees. It was a sickly noise, vile as was the slithering, and the creak of the shelves as the unseen thing bumped and jostled them raised the hairs on my arms. A sort of tendril snaked around the base of one of the rows along the concrete between me and the startled woman, and it looked for all the world like a gigantic grub or maggot laced with veins which pulsed with an undulating soft blue glow. An arm, perhaps. Maybe a finger. In a single fluid motion, I snatched up a loose light bulb from the packaging on the shelf nearest to me 
and flung it into the opposite corner. I suppose it shattered against the wall beside the crouched woman in the dark, but I wasn't there to see it. I was on my feet and lurching through the gloom, back down the row adjacent to the glowing thing in the central aisle before the crash came. There was a heavy gasp, like air leaving a truck tire, a noise I can't help but describe as contented, like a man seeing his first warm meal after days without food. As I quickly skirted the edge of the room and darted out to the half-lit stairs, there was a sort of muffled whimpering. There came a frenzied scuffling and a crash which pierced the still air as some of the shelving was knocked over and dumped its contents to the floor. The last look over my shoulder as I wound my way up the hall towards the exit and away from the wet noises which followed was vague, but it still haunts me when the dark walls of my room seem to close in around me in the night. Though the air was misty with dust and decay, and the central aisle of the low storeroom was partially obscured by hanging piping, from my vantage point on the raised walkway, I saw a flurry of blue light as something shapeless writhed and coiled through the fog, feeding. When at last I stumbled into the unforgiving metal of the front door, and was pulled through into the open air by Orem and his gaggle of compatriots, I didn't stick around to discuss what my escape meant. Orem spoke of my future, of the things that were in store for me, and the things which I might learn, but I insisted I needed to be alone, needed to get out of there and away from that sepulcher in the plains. Orem seemed to understand. It was only natural I'd want to dwell upon what had happened, he said. But when I drove off without Orm in tow, I never came back, nor did I contact him again. He has never attempted to seek me out either, something which I think has nothing to do with the fact that I relocated soon after the trip. I have a sneaking suspicion he could find me if he wished, though for now I worry the nights away alone. I imagine at any time he might show himself and try and explain the situation to me. Still, in all the lonely months since, he hasn't. For that, at least, I'm grateful. For once in a life spent sniffing out things best left alone, I'd rather not know. What does haunt me are those final words shouted after me as I lurched away across the pastures in the light of the gloating moon. Words which lodged deep in my memory, even as I tried to ignore them. You've passed through the gate now, Orem called. You see the world with new eyes. This gives the lights which dance at the corners of my vision, and the noises which echo down empty midnight streets to taunt my tired ears a dreadful significance. For now, I assure myself these are misconstrued imaginings or misinterpreted reflections. Are they? Certainly not. For now, though, it's the one thing I can cling to.